The Gospel of John is one of the greatest books in the Bible, probably printed more than all the books in the New Testament. John always tells us why he writes. He tells us in this book, in the last chapter, he said Jesus did many other things which are not written in this book. But he said these are written that you might believe, and that believing you might have life. There are some specifics that we ought to believe. Belief is not the Savior. Christ is the Savior. We lay hold on to the Savior by believing. There are things we need to believe about him. Specifically, we must believe in his deity. We must believe in his unity with God the Father. We must believe in his substitutionary death and his bodily resurrection. Without that, there is no salvation, for that is the gospel. And so now then, we've come to the end of three years of our Lord's ministry, at least three years. The remaining four or five chapters all take place in the upper room at the Passover. This is the last week after this chapter will be the last week of our Lord's earthly ministry. And thereafter, he's in seclusion with his disciples. In this chapter, chapter 12 and verse 44 through verse 50, our Lord once again and for the very last time is addressing a group of unbelievers. It really is his last sermon. It's the last message that Jesus ever preached. He came to represent God the Father. And he always spoke God's words, for that's what a representative does. A representative never speaks of himself, but he always speaks of that country or that person he represents. Remember Abraham's servant when he went to get a bride for Isaac. He spoke not of himself, but he spoke of his master and his master's son. Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit is come, he will not speak of himself, but he will take the things of mine and he will show them unto you. The Holy Spirit is not here to represent himself, but he is here to represent Jesus. When Jesus was here, he was not here to represent the Holy Spirit, nor was he here to represent himself, but he was here to represent God the Father. Now the Christian has been left on planet Earth not to represent himself. He has been left here to represent his Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we lose sight many times of who we represent. Paul said, now therefore we are ambassadors. And an ambassador represents a country and a king. And we represent a country and a king. We must abide by the laws of the land in which we live, but we are ambassadors of another country. We know that our king is coming again, and there will be a mass exodus. And while we're here, we're to glorify our king by our lives and to try to persuade others to leave a land that is going to be destroyed. And so Jesus, before his final exodus, made one last public sermon. And this morning I want to speak to you on the subject, Jesus' last public sermon. And in this public sermon, you'll notice that he testified of his unity with God. He never lost sight of who he was. And he never lost sight of his purpose. Christians many times do both. A person gets saved and they start giving testimonies about who they are. I'm so glad I'm a child of God. Man, I got saved six months ago. I got saved a year ago. I'm excited now that I'm a Christian. But sad to say, in a few years, many Christians forget who they are. They don't give testimonies anymore. Man, I'm glad I'm a Christian. I'm excited that I got saved. I'm a child of God. And they begin to, for, begin to forget, and the Apostle Paul refers to that crowd. He says they have forgotten that they were purged from their old sins. The Bible says that we're to keep ourselves in the love of God. The church at Ephesus was accused of leaving its first love. And so we need to constantly remember who we are. Jesus never lost sight of it. Secondly, we need to remember who it is we represent. We're not our own, but we're bought with a price. And therefore, we're to glorify God in our spirit and our bodies, which are his. Now, in these few verses, verse 44 through 50, 
our Lord, I believe, emphasized and finally puts the capstone on what he's been trying to teach the nation of Israel for these last three years. And it tells me what it was uppermost on his heart since this was the last public sermon that he preached. In verse 44, Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that seeth me seeth him that sent me. I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came, for I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. The first thing that our Lord included in this message, this last sermon, was that believing in him extends beyond him to believing in the God who sent him. There are always those that believe that somebody is trying to take glory from God, and the nation of Israel specifically believed that. So in verse 44, Jesus made it very clear that if you believe in him, that your belief will transcend and also it, you will believe in God. It's not a matter of saying, I believe in Jesus and God, but when you believe Jesus, you will believe in God and you will believe God. It's impossible to believe in the person of Christ without believing in God and in the God of Christ. Now, you may believe in God and not believe in Christ. That is, you may believe about God, as do the Jews and many others. But you cannot believe in the Lord Jesus Christ without believing in God. It's impossible. So he says, when you believe in me, because of the unity between the Father and myself, it is impossible for you to believe in me and not believe in the God of the Bible and the God of Israel and the God of Jesus. In chapter 13 and verse 20, he, he brings it up again. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that receiveth, whomsoever I send, receiveth me. So Jesus has disciples, and he sent them out in his name, and he said, whosoever, whomsoever I send, if they are received, they receiveth me, and he that receiveth me, receiveth him that sent me. In Matthew chapter 10, please, in Matthew chapter 10, and uh, in verse 40, in Matthew 10, 40, Jesus said, He that receiveth you receiveth me, and he that receiveth me, uh, and he that uh, receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. So a lot of times folks are worried about, well, do I have to receive God? No, you don't. For when you receive Jesus Christ as he is, you automatically receive God. And so the last sermon, Jesus points out the unity between himself and God the Father and assures his followers and those that would believe in him that believing in him extends beyond him to believing in the God who sent him. The second thing Jesus brings out in this passage, in this last and final sermon, is that seeing him is like seeing God the Father. In verse 45, he said, He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. He that hath seen me hath seen him that sent me. Now that's an interesting thing. Do you realize the claim that Christ is making? He is saying that if you receive me, you receive God the Father. And he's saying if you have seen me, you have seen God the Father. So what he is claiming here is an absolute unity between him and his Father. You see, it is impossible to accept Christ and reject God, though you can accept a belief in God and reject Christ. 
But when you accept Jesus Christ, you accept God, and when you see Christ, he says, he that sees me sees him that sent me. It's quite a statement. Because if you go to John, uh, well, let's go to 1 Timothy 1.17, over to the right, 1 Timothy 1.17, the Apostle Paul <clears throat> describing the Godhead, and I think you need to see this, you need to underline it in your Bible, 1 Timothy 1.17. Paul, writing to Timothy, 1.17, says, Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be glory, be honor, and glory forever and ever. One thing you notice in there about God is he's called invisible. The Bible says in John's Gospel, No man has seen God at any time. God is invisible. You will not go far enough into outer space to see God. No matter how powerful the microscopes and the, or the telescopes become, no, far, no matter how far we send out our Sputniks and, uh, and Voyagers, they are not going to see God. Because God is just as present right here this morning as he is in outer space. For he fills space. And so God is the invisible God. No man has seen God at any time. God could, cannot be seen with the telescope or the microscope, for God is everywhere. I don't understand God. I only under, I'm not sure I understand all that God says about himself. But what we do know is that which is revealed. But God is called the invisible God. In John chapter 14, in John 14 verse 9, once again Jesus makes it very clear that when we have seen him, we see God. John 14, 9, Jesus said unto him, referring to Philip, Have I been so long a time with you, Philip, that you have not known me? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. That's quite a statement. He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. If you'll notice down in verse, uh, verse 10, Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father which dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. So Jesus is claiming in this last sermon that he preached on planet earth, the last public sermon, he's claiming that if you believe in him, that that belief transcends beyond him to God the Father. He is also saying that if you see him, you have seen the Father. As a matter of fact, I am not sure that anyone will ever see God the Father. Christ may be the only part of God, the only God that anyone will ever see. A third thing that he brings out in this sermon is that he came from the Father, from outer space, to give light unto the world in verse 47. <clears throat> Chapter 12 and verse 47. 46, and I am come a light into the world. I am come a light into the world. I am come. Well, he came from somewhere. And the truth is that Jesus Christ came from outer space. Jesus always existed. There always was the Son of God. And he came through the virgin birth. God incarnate. When you read in the Old Testament, in Genesis chapter 1, God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. The plural is used. Who's God talking about? You're talking about the angels? We're made in the image of God. We're not made like angels. So the Trinity is talking when God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. At the flood, before Noah's flood, God said, Let us go down and see this thing at the Tower of Babel. So we have a, a plurality of names referring to God. In the Old Testament, in the book of Isaiah, it says, Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. So the Son of God always was. And the Trinity always existed. Trinity and unity. And Jesus is trying to convey this unbelieving, to, to convey this message to this unbelieving crowd that they might be saved. And what I'm telling you this morning, 
according to the scripture is necessary and it is necessary for you to believe these things to become a child of God. Why? To reject Jesus Christ is to reject God. And to see Jesus Christ is to see God. And to realize that he came from outer space to this planet Earth through the virgin birth is to believe in the incarnation. And John chapter 1, if you'll go with me there, John chapter 1 and verse 1, <clears throat> 1, 1. What we're reading in chapter 12 is consistent. In 1.1, 1, 1, he says, in the beginning was the word. In the beginning. In the beginning. The beginning of what? The beginning of everything. In the beginning was the word. The word didn't become. The word already was. You just put a stake anywhere you want to in, pa in the past, and wherever you drive that stake, the sun already was. There wasn't a time when there wasn't a son. He always was. In the beginning. Not the beginning of the creation. He already was. Not the beginning of the making, creating of the angels. He already was. So any beginning you want to talk about, the son was. That's why he's called the I am in the book of Exodus. Before Abraham was, I am. God's name is the I am. So in verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, <coughs> and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And not as the Jehovah's Witness Bible, they have changed it. And it reads, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. There is no Greek text anywhere in the world that will support that interpretation. For the Son of God is not a God, he is the God. And so you have to rewrite the Bible to come up with any other belief than in the Trinity and the unity of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Verse 3, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. There's nothing made that wasn't made by the Son of God. Verse 4, in him was life. Now, folks, life has to begin somewhere. Life can be terminated. We worry about the destruction of certain animal species, and if, and if uh, the last one dies, they're not going to make any more. So life has to have a beginning, both physical life and eternal life. Life is more than physical existence. There is the life of God. An animal has physical existence and has breath, and an unsaved person has physical existence and has breath. But he doesn't have the life of God. And that life of God is what was given to man when God breathed into him the breath of life. He not only received a physical life, but he received a life of God. And when Adam disobeyed God, the life of God died in this man or departed from him. Now, he continued to be a physical being with physical uh, attributes and breath. But the life of God vacated him. And everyone born thereafter was born without the life of God in him. That's why we must be born again. And Jesus is the life of God coming back to the planet Earth. And in verse 4 it says, In him was life. In him was this eternal life. He is the source, the pool of life. And in him was life, and this life was the light of men. If you'll notice again, <clears throat> verses 9 through 11, that was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. We're talking about Jesus coming from outer space. He was the life of God. He was God life. Life, God is life. And apart from God, there is no life. He is the fountain. He is the reservoir. He is the ocean. He is life. It's not that God has life. He is life. It's not that God has love. God is love. It's not something God has. I have life, but I'm not life. I can lose it. I can forfeit it. And that's the end of it. But not with God. 
For if God lost life, God wouldn't exist, for he is life. He's the very source. And when man disobeyed God, he died and he lost it, and the Son of God came to give it back, for he is God the life. And so in verse 9, he said he was the true light, the real light, the real life. People talk about life. Everybody's looking for life. Order this course, take this course, do this, do that. You'll find out what life's all about. Nonsense. Verse 10, he was in the world, and the world was made by him. Obviously, if the world was made by him, he had to be outside the world. He is greater than his creation, and destroy the world, and you don't affect God. You destroy the world, you're done, but God isn't. For God is greater than his creation, and he's separate from his creation. And so the Son of God. So what Jesus is preaching in this message, that he not only is the God that you believe in, that he is the Father you see, but that he also came from outer space, out from God, to give life to those who will believe. Let's go to John 8. John chapter 8 and verse 44. John 8, 44. Or 42. <clears throat> Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me. Watch this. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Now you and I can slice it any way we want to, but those are pretty bold claims. As a matter of fact, if those claims are not true, then Jesus is a raving maniac. And you would be honest and do yourself a favor by throwing your book to the wind. For the claims are unbelievable. He says that believing in him is not only believing in him, but that faith transcends to God himself, for he is God. Seeing me is seeing God believing on me and seeing me and realizing uh, that I came out from the Father, from outer space, to give the light of salvation in verse 47. He said, I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. It's a pretty bold claim. In verse 49 and 50, he spoke whatever God told him to. In verse 49, he said, I have not spoken of myself. But he said, I have, uh, but what the Father has sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. You understand he's claiming infallibility? He said, I never speak of myself. What preacher, evangelist, or teacher, or soul winner could ever honestly make that claim? Do you realize you would be claiming infallibility? He claimed it here. He said, I don't speak of myself. Whatever the Father, I have a commandment, and what he tells me, I speak. And John the Baptist said, I'm just a voice in the wilderness. Jesus said, I speak the very commandments of God. So he is claiming all authority in this last sermon. A little boy went to, for an interview to get a job, and the manager looked down perhaps with some a grin on his face and said to him, said, young man, what can you do? He said, I can do what I'm told. Well, that's more than most of us. But the Son of God did what he was told to do. He came out from God and spake the very words of God. So I can rest assured that I have the authority of God when I have Jesus' words. I worked at Boeing for seven years, and I, I remember a fellow that, I, I was a strange breed I'd never heard of before, but this fellow... He had what he called a red-letter edition of the Bible. Now, a red-letter edition of the Bible is having a Bible where all the words of Jesus are in red. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. There may be some folks here today, you have a Bible like that. There's nothing wrong with that. But this man believed that inspiration only extended to the red letters of the Bible. In other words, he didn't believe that the Apostle Paul spoke the very word of God. 
He didn't believe that Simon Peter and others were infallible in what they said. In other words, it was not God's word. David and the Old Testament, only what Jesus said. Now, we don't hold that view. But we do believe that when Jesus spoke, he spoke the infallible, inerrant word of God. Verse 48. Therefore, he concludes that to reject him and his words is to reject God. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judges him. He is simply saying here that if I don't accept his words, that I've got somebody that's going to judge me. So we see authority a stamped from verse 44 to verse 50. And Jesus is wrapping up his three-year ministry, public ministry, and he is telling this crowd that I am not separate from God the Father and that when you believe in me, you must believe in God the Father. When you see me, you have seen God the Father. That I did not originate here on planet Earth as you have, but I came from outer space to bring salvation and light as light comes from outer space. He said, I spoke the very commandments of God and to reject me is to reject God the Father, verse 48. Now, in winding this up in his last sermon, he makes it clear that his first mission here was not judgment. In verse 47, the last part of that verse, he says, For I came not to judge the world. You see, Jesus has two missions. Number one is accomplished. His first mission was to come through the virgin birth, to be born, and to spend his ministry preaching and teaching the grace of God and trying to turn men and women to God. And that was a ministry of salvation and a ministry of healing and a ministry of mercy. He was called the meek and lowly Jesus. And he has accomplished the first segment of his ministry. He said, I came not to judge the world. He didn't come to destroy people. He didn't come to banish people to the lake of fire. He came to tell people the truth and to tell them how they could be saved. So he said, I came not to judge the world. And he didn't. But he is coming again. And if you'll turn with me to Revelation, please. Revelation chapter uh, 19. Revelation 19, verse 11. Here it talks about the second part of that coming. 19, verse 11. And I saw heaven open. This is two thousand, at least 2,000 years after. As a matter of fact, this event has not taken place. It's 2,000 years after the, the life and death of Jesus. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. That's not what he did the first time. His eyes are a flame of fire. Wasn't the first time. And on his head were many crowns, just a crown of thorns the first time. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself, and he was clothed in a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God, John 1. And the armies which are in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Verse 15. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, with which he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he tread the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And so he tells us in John chapter 12, verse 47, I came not to judge the world. And he didn't. Jesus is the Savior. Though he was God in the flesh. He was born in a barn. Though he was God in the flesh, he borrowed a boat to preach from. Though we were God in the flesh, he borrowed a donkey on which to ride. We were God in the flesh, 
He died on a borrowed cross that was not his own. Though he were God in the flesh, he was buried in another man's tomb, not his own. Though he were God in the flesh, he said, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests in which to sleep. But the Son of Man doesn't have a place to lay his head. I came not to judge the world, but that the world might be saved.